Why is it so important to play as a gay character? I'll never forget my first romantic encounter in Mass Effect. The lights were low, soft music was playing, a blue-skinned woman with alien dreadlocks was looking deep into my eyes. Sparks flew. Whoa, whoa, sorry about that. Anyway, the freedom to pursue sexual relationships with other characters is one of the most fascinating aspects to Bioware's games. Players are allowed to live out whatever sexual orientation they choose, be that straight, gay, or I don't know, maybe you have a preference for reptilian species with green skin. With previous Bioware games, being gay was an opt-in activity. If you weren't interested, homosexuality was totally off the table and didn't exist in your game. But for the recent Dragon Age Inquisition, Bioware included an exclusive exclusively gay character, the mustachioed and chiseled elemental mage Dorian. David Gator, the lead writer for the game, based Dorian on his own experiences as a gay man. There's also Sarah, Dorian's female counterpart, who, according to her profile on the Dragon Age wiki, only dates other women, enjoys hunting ogres, and is an elf raised by humans. We're breaking stereotypes, people. This has put some non-gay players in, shall we say, unknown territory. Many players, for instance, weren't expecting for their in-game match to be neither of Dragon Age's two female love interests, but the dude. You have to fight for what's in your heart. This, as you might imagine, is having a profound effect on people. Just look at the article that Mike Rougeau wrote for Kotaku where he talks about his character falling in love with Dorian. But hold up, why is it so important that Bioware's games include gay characters? Well, there are a couple big reasons. For one thing, having a fully realized gay character is only fair. I mean, think about all the gay players who are forced to play straight roles in every single game. In games, there are almost no gay characters, especially when you're talking about big blockbuster AAA titles. Yes, there are some exceptions to the rule. There's Ellie and The Last of Us Gay, Tony and GTA 4, and possibly Tingle. But regardless, the subject is really only broached in additional downloadable content or lightly suggested, but not really on center stage. And representation in media for a wide range of sexuality and gender issues is valuable because it gives the LGBT community characters that they can relate to. Not that they can't relate to straight characters, but you know, as I said earlier, it's really only fair. Regardless, even if you're not gay, the inclusion of gay characters just makes games better. One of the biggest strengths of video games as a medium is that they allow you to try on distinct roles that are different from you in real life. If that role can be a fearless treasure hunter like Nathan Drake, who kills hundreds of people, albeit in a dashing manner, why can't it be something more nuanced and realistic, like occupying the consciousness of a gay character? who also kills hundreds of people. Freedom isn't free, my friends. Video games have an incredible potential in helping us understand human sexuality writ large. Mike Rougeau's vicariously gay playthrough of Dragon Age illustrates this fact perfectly. He writes the experience helped him empathize with people whose life experiences are not his own. Sure, you can empathize by watching shows with LGBT characters like Glee or Transparent or just hanging out with your gay friends, but because you're potentially playing as a gay character in Dragon Age, it's super potent. According to the research of Nick Yee and Jeremy Balenson, the act of inhabiting other perspectives in virtual environments like video games reduces negative stereotypes. It's because experiencing empathy involves simulating the experiences of others in our neural circuits. The Machine to Be Another VR project operates on the same premise. It's this crazy experiment that allows you to see the world through the eyes of another human being. You can even gender swap. In other words, controlling an avatar can lead to greater understanding and acceptance. So it really hits home when you see how Dorian's sexuality has caused him to endure all sorts of pain and hardship, like being estranged from his family, something that happens to gay people in real life all the time. My father never understood. Living a lie, it festers inside of you like poison. Am I saying that every protagonist, villain, sidekick, and innskeeper should be gay, bi, or trans? Of course not, but the truth is is that we could stand for a lot more of them. In this regard, Bioware is an island unto itself, which is curious. While I was researching this episode, I started to wonder, why are they one of the only big studios to feature gay characters? I think part of the reason is that Bioware has a commitment to the RPG ethos that says, it's your thing, do what you want to do. Or is that the Isley Brothers? Do what you wanna do. 
doesn't matter. Bioware's earliest games like Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights hail from the Dungeons and Dragons rulebook. The founders of Bioware were actually going to make medical software, hence the name, but they soon began playing a bunch of pen and paper games instead, and they turned those games into computer games. Around the tabletops of yore, one of the biggest lures of D&D was that the dungeon master who organized the game could make the story anything he or she wanted, and players followed suit by role-playing as a character in this world. And because RPGs simulate our fantasies, romance often plays a part. Again, turning to the research of Nick Yee, he points out how platonic and romantic relationships flourish in RPG environments. In fact, before Bioware started making this a feature in their games, many players would mod Baldur's Gate to add in gay relationships. And it's this culture of making your own rules and romantic role play which Bioware has generally adhered to that's what's enabled gay characters like Dorian to find their way into mainstream games. Bioware is merely delivering the most authentic RPG experience available, and that includes human sexuality, also fireballs. And just because other companies aren't making titles in the RPG genre doesn't mean that they're off the hook. Oh, a big one! People are starting to demand that gay characters are included, as we saw when Nintendo released Tamodachi Life without same-sex relationships last year. Also, the excuse that only heteronormative games will sell no longer cuts it. To the contrary, the continued success of Bioware shows that featuring diverse relationships is a selling point, not a liability. In fact, it just makes the game world more rich and varied, and if it's a good game, people will buy it. So your move, everybody else. So what do you think? Why is Bioware so good at showing a range of human sexuality, and why has it taken other companies so long to follow suit? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Last week we asked whether or not games are too long, and man, you all had a lot to say. So let's take a look. So I want to start with a comment from Tony at home, who was gracious enough to uh, sort of outline what his day looks like. So let me walk you through it. Nine to five, Tony goes to work, like most people do. Um, from five, 5.30 to 6.30, Tony works out, which is great. Physical activity, physical health is super important. And then there's like another hour for errands um, or cooking dinner. So around eight o'clock, Tony is sort of free, but Tony also likes to code, so that's another hour. And Tony says that leaves about two hours in a given day to spend time doing anything else. So that means like, you know, courting the girl down the street that he mentioned, who he takes out for ice cream, that's adorable, um, calling friends and family, and also video games. The reason why I bring this up is that it's important to recognize, or at least to ask the question, whether or not games as a medium allow for a wide range of human experiences. As you can see from Tony's schedule, he's someone who, like me, grew up playing games, and when I was, you know, much younger, I had a lot more time to play them, and someone who wants to continue that passion in later life. But even though, you know, sort of Tony and my schedule has changed a lot over the last 10, 15 years, the length of games that, in terms of what games ask you to do, the amount of time they ask you to put into them, hasn't changed as much to sort of accommodate people like us who might want to play a game like Dragon Age, but just simply don't have the time. So again, I think it's really important to think about the wide range of people who have other schedules and who don't have, um, you know, sort of lots of discretionary time. So when we say that game is only 15 hours long or only 20 hours long, what you're really saying is that someone like Tony, for example, should spend two weeks straight giving up everything else, all the other free time that he has just to play that particular game. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that games should be demanding that. But, you know, it's hard to see that, you know, if you have a lot of free time, it's hard to see that particularly when you're younger, but, you know, life changes and hopefully games can change as well. Rhapsody 230 had some strong words, disagreed with me, which is totally fine, but there's two things I wanted to deal with. Specifically, Rhapsody says that if you don't finish a game, it's because it was bad. And I would say that that's not necessarily the case. There are lots of reasons why someone might not finish a game. Being a bad game might be one of them, but simply not having enough time to finish said game um, could also be one of those reasons. One other person in the comments had pointed out that, well, why don't you just break the game, why don't you break your game playing experiences up into chunks? Well, if you're looking at something like Dragon Age, for example, and you have a limited amount of time, as I mentioned in Tony's comments, then you're not going to have enough chunks in a given period of your life to be able to finish a game that's, you know, 60 to 80 hours long. Uh, the other thing that Rhapsody says is that, uh, you know, basically if you spend 70, 70 euros uh, in, in, in Rhapsody's case, 70 euros for a game that's 10 hours long, enjoy being poor. Uh, which brings up a totally separate point, which I didn't really deal with in the issue, which is how much someone's time is worth. So to give a little context, the average amount of time that someone spends in looking at a painting at a museum is several seconds long. And we're talking about great works of art, for example. Uh, and the question is whether or not games on a, I don't know, per hour time should demand a higher cost than spending time 
time at a museum. The way that I look at it is that, you know, it costs 15, 20 dollars to go to a great museum. You might spend two to three hours there. And so, yeah, if you spend, you know, 10 hours on something that costs about 60, you know, 60 or 70 euros or dollars or whatever, then that seems about right to me. But hey, every person has a different value on time. But uh, yeah, thank you for your comment. Jermel Williams says that a game should be as long as it needs to be. And I completely agree. Now, Jermel and I have different, uh, different approximations for how much time um, that would be. Jermel says 30 to 40 hours feels about right. I would say somewhere in the eight to 15 hour range. But I think that maxim is very much true that a game really should only be as long as it should be. And I think that the issue is, is that our expectations sort of collectively, as you can see from the sort of split opinion of this episode, is that some people want games to be super, super long and some people want games to be a lot, a lot shorter. And I think what's important and what hasn't been established is a sense of trust. As I mentioned in the episode, a sense of mutual trust and that game designers sort of trust if they make something shorter that they're not going to be punished for on the market and that uh, players aren't going to get angry if something isn't necessarily as long as they would like it to be, provided that the time spent playing those games is worthwhile. But yes, Jermel, I think you're totally right. Aaron Neal hits the nail on the head, specifically looking at the rise of uh, mobile games as an example of how um, there are some shorter games in the market that sort of like fit into people's lives with their particular schedules. So the one thing I would point out, and we haven't really dealt with this too much on game show, is this divide between casual and hardcore, right? So casual is usually used as a shorthand for people who don't like challenge and don't have a lot of time. And then hardcore is the sort of the complete converse. And I would argue that there are people who play casual games in a hardcore way, like someone who spends 70 or 80 hours on, I don't know, a game like Candy Crush Saga, even if that's broken up into 10 minute segments on the train. And there are people who play hardcore games in a casual way. Um, you know, I would be someone who fits in that category. I'd playing Wolfenstein right now from last year. And that's a sort of like a hardcore game, but I play it in a way that, you know, sort of fits my particular time schedule. So uh, yeah, so I think that that question, we need to sort of like blur these lines between those and not use casual as a pejorative, as a bad thing. If, you know, as you get older, you don't nearly have as much time, but you still want some of those sort of like big epic experiences. But yeah, thanks Neil, totally right on. 